Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Amy Rosebro. She is a archeologist with the Wisconsin Historical Society. She's gonna be here to talk with us about fire, shipwreck, and cheese, Wisconsin's lost coastal communities. She was born in West Plains in the Missouri Ozarks and went to high school at West Plains High School. Then she went to Missouri State University to study archeology. span She got her master's degree in archeology span at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. And then she came here to UW-Madison to get her PhD in anthropology and archeology. span In the year 2000, she started at the Wisconsin Historical Society. And I'm greatly looking forward to this talk. Would you please join me in welcoming Amy Rosebro to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Everybody, uh, you can hear me. A little sound check there. All right. So I'm here to talk about Wisconsin's Lake Michigan coast. And when people visit the coast, they tend to go to the cities, they Sheboygan, Manitowoc, or they're off in vacation homes, in very rural environments. And we have this picture in our heads of what Lake Michigan and its shoreline is and what it was. We're missing some of the picture. Wisconsin was home to a great many ports at one time, and most of them have vanished. So we have ghost ports all up and down the coast, kind of hiding in plain sight. We found out about these communities due to this shipwreck, the Shipwreck Northerner. Went down with a load of cordwood, and we featured it on an Archaeology Month poster. It was nominated to the National Register of Historic Places, and during the analysis of the ship, for that nomination, its home port was discovered, a place called Ronksville. Now, if you're wondering where the heck is Ronksville, you're not alone, because everyone was wondering where the heck is Ronksville. Everybody thought, well, that's odd, and kind of put it to the side for a while. When our poster was distributed, however, some family members, descendants of the Ronks, contacted us, and they said, yeah, Ronksville. Our ancestors used to own a pier. We'd like you to find it. <laughs> sure, okay. And that's what got us started. So that was the, the origin of Wisconsin's Lost Coastal Community Project. We headed out to find the place where the northerner came from. And you see the divers there. If you look down in the hold, you see that it's still full of cordwood. We did eventually find a map, one. 1866-1877 coastal chart uh, produced by the US Army. Uh, shoreline was done in 66. Maritime areas, the depth of the lake was done in 1877, and Ronksville appears there. The family helped us out with some deeds that set aside land for the Luxemburger Pier Company that they were associated with, and a forever road, used for the public forever, it is not in use now. Okay. That was Ronksville. Their family lore said that Ronksville was founded and the pier was built in part to supply goods to a store owned by their ancestors in nearby Lake Church, just a couple of miles inland to the south and a little to the west. They were not happy with how long it took to get goods to and from Milwaukee, or from their shore, store to Milwaukee, from Milwaukee to their store. They wanted a quicker way to resupply, a way to sell goods uh, at a cheaper cost to get more customers. So they built this pier, founded the Luxemburger Pier Company, and put a pier out into the lake. This is Ozaki County. So we're not too far from Port Washington at this spot. As we're doing the research afterwards, okay, what about Ronksville? You know, what's going on with Ronksville? Why was there a town there? Why is there no longer a town there? How did this little town function? We started coming across accounts of other little towns that don't exist anymore. And we're still adding to this map. And at one point, Lake Michigan was just fringed with piers that extended out into the lake. And most of these communities, there is nothing left. They're vacation homes, or it's just farmland. Okay. So one ghost port after the other. And then that let us think, all right, what's going on? How did so many towns disappear? Why were they built? Places like Newport, 
If you've ever been to Newport State Park, hung out on the beach up in Door County, you've been to a ghost port. This was Newport back in the day. And pictures taken from the end of the pier, a widening, a turnaround where horse teams could circle around and get pointed back towards land without falling into the lake. And you see lumber piled up on shore. You see buildings, a whole little complex. So if you go there today, just nothing. A beach, a little kiosk, a restroom, and some grass. Underneath, however, that pier's still there. Oh, lovely photos taken by Tamara Thompson, the Wisconsin Historical Society, who's here today. Hi, Tammy. I put this one in because there's fish. <laughs> As the research for this project has continued, we realized that there are differences in the port. So we're, we're starting to see patterns. So the southernmost port, so they actually start close to Chicago, go up past Milwaukee, and then around, to, around Sheboygan. Uh, we're calling it the southern ports. They're very much cordwood oriented, like the northerners. So Ronksville is part of this. But they set a pattern okay, where you have what's essentially the 19th, 19th century equivalent of a truck stop places where wood is available for people to pick up. People are chopping, they're bringing it in for sale, they're loading it onto the pier. It's available to the countryside and to people passing by in the lake. But they also have a store. And you'll notice that they're advertising for help here. We want these choppers. Come on in, choppers. We're going to give you a great job, and we're going to supply you so cheaply if you buy the goods from our store. It's a tiny little hint of a company town here. And this is a pattern that goes all up and down the coast. Each of these communities has a store. The cordwood is being shipped out, not just for heating stoves, but for industry. Uh, these people are hauling cordwood, for example, to a lime kiln, and especially for the lake ships, for the steamers. You know, every steamer on a trip from the Eastern Great Lakes here would eat acres and acres worth of forest in the form of cordwood to keep those boilers going. So when I say truck stop, I mean truck stop. This is a gas station of a sort. In the middle of the lake, so Northheim, Yorksville, Centerville, there are still a few tiny little towns available at some of these spots, but no piers, and they are all facing away from the lake. They've kind of forgotten their origins. These were pier communities, and they were shipping out cordwood, sure, but also agricultural products like grain. They were harvesting fish, rendering down fish oil. One town had a brewery until it caught on fire. Another a town or two had a brickyards. And they were shipping these materials south to Milwaukee, to Chicago, to Racine, to Kenosha, to the cities that are rising up on the lake that wanted beer and wanted fish and wanted flour and wanted building materials. And they continued on for a while until the railroad came. Cheaper to ship by railroad, so these communities then begin to fold out too. But up in the north, that's where things get interesting. Northern Wisconsin had something that Chicago and the Midwest wanted very, very, very badly. They wanted lumber. They wanted timber. And Kewanee County, Manitowoc County, Door County had pine. They had cedar. They had hemlock. They had massive forests full of the best lumber timber around. And those forests moved. They were harvested and sent south one shipload at a time from these piers. And the scale of this trade is absolutely unfathomable. So an account that we came across on our research written by an individual in the lumber trade in Chicago in 1866, right at the very beginning of the lumber boom, even then, the scale was beyond measure. He tried. He tried to capture it. He said, all right, in the last three years, if we, we make planks out of all this timber, it would stretch to the moon you know, with, with thousands of miles to spare. And that's just what came into Chicago in three years. Everything that had come into Chicago to date, he estimated, would be enough to build a three-story building from Chicago to the West Coast, large enough to house the population of Europe. And that was the start of the boom. I mean, it's unbelievable. As those forests were cleared, land opened up, and settlers moved in. This is at the height of Wisconsin's immigration peak. People are coming in, especially from Germany, from Bohemia. 
uh, from what would become the Czech Republic, from Scandinavia. And they wanted land. And this was cheap land, a buck twenty-five an acre. You could get this. But it was hard land. It was north, and it was full of these stupid stumps. <laughs> and I cannot even imagine you know, coming into a farm and going, I, you can't even grow your first crop until this stuff is out of the way, the back-breaking labor. So it was a hard farming. All of it made possible by these schooners. The schooners brought the people. They shipped away the lumber. Now, the problem with Wisconsin's coastlines is that it's shallow a good long ways out. So schooners that would come in too close, if they weren't at one of the harbor towns, Sheboygan, Manitowoc, Kiwani, Algoma, they are where they are because there are rivers there, because the ships can get in closer, because you can build a harbor and give safe refuge to a ship. Away from those, there's no place to come into shore, and ships that try, they don't get very far. They, they turn into things that Tammy and, and our divers get to see. It's rocky up in Door County. There are shoals just under the water, sandy sandbars once you get a little further south with hidden boulders here and there and other hazards. And ships that would come in would just crash, sink. What they would do is, if they're landing people, they'd put them in the ship's boat, and they and all their possessions would, would go in on the little ship's boat and then jump into the water and wade ashore with all their goods. If a little community needed housing, they needed lumber, sometimes they'd just push the lumber off the deck and let it float in. But if you wanted to export out, that was not a great way to do things. So the people who wanted to make money at lumbering, who wanted to cut the forest, built piers, bridge piers. So a bridge that would go over the beach and then out across that shallow area into deeper water where schooners could theoretically safely come in and tie up and load. So this is one of the few images we have of a bridge pier in operation. This is the oldest photograph we have of Kiwani around 1856. And you see Volk's Pier, the first pier in Kiwani County, reaching out into the harbor there and some schooners either loading or unloading at the end. All of our little ghost ports started just like this. When the piers were built, they were built using pilings, if you could sink pilings into softer sand or sediment, steam pile drivers usually, or cribs. Cribs favored up in Door County, where the bottom is rockier and you can't sink pilings in. And you can imagine kind of a log cabin. These were built very carefully out on the lake ice in the winter, and then in the spring, the wood would warm up, they would melt through, fall, and hopefully they had them the right height <laughs> so that there'd be enough sticking up above the water to, to put the decking on. So Newport, that image you saw, that was a crib pier. And this is what they're after, those forests. All of that lumber, all of that pine. If you know what you're doing and you're a lumber dealer, you can cut this or buy it from farmers who are clearing their land load it onto your pier, and sell it in Chicago for a profit, if you know what you're doing and you have good luck. So down come the forests. The lumberjacks, these are a lot of, some of them are working for you if you're a pier owner, and some of them are just farm boys who are looking to make some extra money over the winter months because this is very much a winter occupation. You want snow and ice on the ground because you're going to be moving very, very heavy things. And having it glide along on the ice is a lot easier than trying to roll on wagon wheels where the axles are breaking and the wheels are breaking and things are tumbling off. And I noticed that they're sitting on top of this. As I'm doing the research for this, reading the, the period accounts, they're always talking about people being crushed by shifting loads. And I'm thinking, how is the load falling over into the driver's seat? Oh, no, there's no driver's seat. <laughs> they're riding on top of these things. So if the chains aren't secured, <laughs> People get dragged, people get broken legs, or, or worse. The horses are vicious, absolutely vicious. <laughs> They're not helping. It's brought in many of these communities to a sawmill, and not all of them had a mill, but most, where it would then be milled out into lumber. Not always, however. So the, the pier yards at these locations contain not just milled lumber, but railroad ties, huge commodity. This is a time when the railroads, transcontinental railroads are being built, so they need those. 
cedar posts for fencing. Imagine that the Great Plains are being settled, lots of fences needed. You need lumber, of course, to build housing across the Midwest, okay. telegraph poles, and hemlock bark, which is used for tanning cowhide. So the leather trade, Milwaukee, the Eastern Vogel Leather Company in Milwaukee was a huge consumer of hemlock bark from this area. The piers themselves, again, pier or crib, would extend out into lake hundreds and sometimes thousands of feet and have a platform of some sort out on the end, again, so those horse teams could turn around. Sometimes the horses didn't turn around. Sometimes they ran all the way out to the end of the pier and jumped off, kind of Thelma and Louise, in wagon and all. So as I said, those horses are awful. <laughs> Loaded onto schooners. Once the lake ice is out, shipping season would, stop, would start, hauling season would stop, unless you're a farmer, in which case you're bringing a few wagon loads at a time, mostly shingles. And they say money doesn't grow on trees. In Kiwani and Door counties, if you're a shingle maker, it does. <laughs> because you could <laughs> chop that wood up into shingles and bring it into these pure communities and sell it. Or trade it. Shipped south. This is a shot from Milwaukee. Most of it's going to Chicago, but Milwaukee had its share. And I absolutely love this. This is an H.H. H. Bennett image from our collections. And you see the schooner is just loaded down. They could not pile any more wood on this thing. The hold's full, the decks are full. It's sort of listing. It's being pulled in by a tug, and it's being pulled to the railroad yards for all this lumber to be unloaded, put onto railroad cars, and shipped out to help build Kansas City, St. Joseph, St. Louis, you know, Bismarck, points west, not just Chicago. So when we say that Wisconsin's forest built the Midwest, they, they literally built the Midwest. Our forest moved south and west onto the plains. When the ships returned to the pier communities, no sense having them go back empty. Again, all of these had their store, their pier store. So often they would be loaded with cargo, with merchandise, to resupply. If you're a pier owner, you want a great big resupply in the spring and another one in the fall right before the lake ice comes in. Because in Kiwani and Door counties, the road systems really aren't there yet. This is where your food comes from, <laughs> for the most part before the farms are established. So you've got to supply in, because once the lake ice is in, that's it. We have an account of Sturgeon Bay, the lake ice freezing in a little too early. They hadn't completely resupplied, and all of Sturgeon Bay turned out to cut a 15-mile road through the forest to one spot that hadn't frozen in yet, where they could get that supply before winter really cut them off from the rest of the world. Inside the stores, you'd find all kinds of things. Not just things that are needed, but things that are wanted. This is the interior, we believe, of the Dean's Pier or Carlton store. And you can see, just, just looking at the image, there's horse tackle, horse blankets. There are casks that I think are containing molasses in the corner. Uh, we, you know, we have some accounts of people coming into the store and tapping those casks when the, the store clerks weren't looking to get a little free molasses on their bread. One account says the store owner came around the corner and he found somebody with a brand new broom that was for sale and he was using the handle of the broom like a dipping stick. <laughs> that started a bit of an argument. Uh, according to the account, it ended with the, the clerk saying that he was too pure for this world, which I'm pretty sure in the 1870s is a horrible insult. Okay. But they're, they're also carrying boots and shoes and ladies' hats, sewing supplies, cloth, children's clothing, anything a lumberjack would want, dishes, stoves, seed for, to plant your crops with, the plows to use to plant the crops. If you wanted it, it was somewhere in this store. And you could buy it with cash, or you could buy it with wood. Bring in your shingles. Here's my shingles. I'd like a hat, please. And away you go. And if you're a good store owner, if you've got good clerks, and you're listening to the price points, you're making money both ways, hopefully. Not everybody did. So these little towns popped up around these communities. If you had a mill, you needed people to work it. You needed clerks to man the store. You needed people to load goods onto the ships. You needed boarding houses for sailors and travelers, hotels. And if there are a lot of board men around who work very hard, some of them are going to want a saloon or a dance hall. 
So other businesses sort of cluster around, and little tiny communities, hamlets, spring up at these locations. So Coastal Management Program was very, very generous and gave us a grant uh, the previous year to take a closer look at some of the peer communities in Kewanee County, right on the southern edge of the Pinery, something we could compare to Ronksville and compare later to Door County, and we're just start starting the Door County study now, again, thanks to coastal management, so yay. So we headed up, and we found records of quite a few communities there. Weren't able to find remnants of all of them. The Observation Point Pier, or Sprague's Pier, is, kind of underneath a nuclear power plant. <laughs> Thought maybe we'd, we'd leave that one alone. Okay. Okay. Silver Creek up near the northern edge of the county, we didn't even know about until after the study was done. It popped up in just a couple of little obscure newspaper accounts. I was like, what is this? Both of those peer communities were here and then left very, very quickly. Their owners, their managers, were not good at negotiating those price points. They went into a ton of debt and wound up being sued into bankruptcy. The owner of Sprague's Pier, Sprague, was married to the sister of Racine's founder, Gilbert Knapp. Okay. And it's very interesting that one of those final lawsuits, one of the people suing him is Gilbert Knapp, <laughs> sued by his own brother-in-law. That had to have been fun around the house. <laughs> so they go out poof, early into the Civil War, and they're done. The rest hung on through the lumber boom, at least. The piers appear now as pilings, just under the surface of the water, some of them a little above the surface of the water. I'm kind of surprised no one's run into Dean's Pier yet. Okay. But if you're ever boating around near shore, you know, keep, a, keep an eye out. See if, see if there are posts under the water, kind of hiding in plain sight. Okay. They're all going to be where a small stream enters the lake. These are founded at these locations so that the streams could be dammed in some cases to run the mill, but mostly as a place to bank the logs to store it. And they're very, very, very quiet now, but they didn't used to be. These were wild, bustling, noisy, busy places where all kinds of things happen, good and bad. Like this ship that's about to, to beach itself there on, on the shore. Most of them did have a shipwreck or two, and in some of the ships are still there. Let's take another look. So Grimm's Pier, we'll start with poor little Grimm's Pier, right in the middle of the county. Uh, didn't really last overly long. Henry Grimm put his pier in a bad location. <laughs> there were submerged boulders hiding all around his spot, like little landmines. So when he appears in the press, it's usually because some ship has gone down. Most of the time they get them back up again, not always. But he, he did a decent trade. The maps only show his store. He never had much of a community. He, he couldn't really get that many people to come settle where he was. He didn't have a mill, so no need to employ that many people. Grimm's Pier never really got off the ground completely. And once the lumber boom was over and he'd sunk about five ships and had one horse team, Thelma and Louise, into the lake, he seems to have decided, that's enough for me. <laughs> Sold out moved to town and started a hotel. He did much better at the hospitality business than he did with peers. <laughs> this is what you see out there now, just again, a scatter of pilings out in the lake. Alaska nearby was founded by three of the wealthiest merchants in Kiwani, including a guy named Wojciech Mashek, who supposedly arrived in the company of a Russian prince to see if uh, Russia could maybe find some colonies of their own in Siberia. I can't find anything to confirm that, which is a shame. It's a fantastic story. But Alaska was another one that sort of came and went. It was, existed basically to make money for these three men, and they did make a lot of money, but they already had a lot of money, so whatever. Okay. Alaska's most notable appearance into history is in 1871, which, if you know your Wisconsin history, you know is the Great Peshtigo Fire, which it wasn't just Peshtigo, it burned right through Kiwani County too, right through the northern part, and came right to Alaska's doors and Grimm's Pier as well. The hardest effectual fight, the newspaper said, was at Alaska. The pier itself caught on fire multiple times. These men had families there. Refugees had gathered at these points. The ship Alaska, not, not the community Alaska, a lot of 
names Alaska here, but the ship Alaska was tied up to Alaska Pier and they wanted it to stay there because this is their escape. When the pier caught on fire the first time, the captain said, nope, not losing my boat, and off it went. So they were stranded. So they're fighting hard because it was literally life and death for them. Same thing was happening at Grimm's to, to a slightly smaller extent. And they lost thousands of dollars worth, but Alaska, with the exception of one house, they saved everything. You know, in the middle of the firestorm. That is, to me, absolutely amazing. But that fire afterwards, as much as a horrible tragedy as it was, when you read the newspapers about 10 years afterward, it's amazing. The columnists are saying that is the best thing that ever happened to Kiwani County. Because of all of those stumps burned up. <laughs> the soil, a foot of ash, fertilized it. And the farmers wanted that easy ground. And in they came to take the cutover lands just open farms. If you want to know why Door County is not quite as farmed as Kiwani County, this is one of the reasons why. Okay. Langworthy was founded just after the fire, named after a Captain Langworthy who headed the, the relief efforts in the, the aftermath of the Peshtigo firestorm. It was built to serve the little community of Casco, which is eight miles inland. Casco's founder, Edward Decker, owned the local newspaper. He did his best to get the railroad to Kiwani County he got a little sidetracked with that endeavor when a horse bit his arm off. <laughs> off. <laughs> I said they're awful horses in Kiwani County. I meant it. <laughs> After he recuperated, he picked up property on the lake shore where a person who was attending this found a sawmill got burned out in the Great Fire. And he said, I will give you four times what your land is worth if you will sell me this location. And the guy knew a deal when he, he heard it. So he sold out to Decker. And Langworthy Pier was born at that point. They, Decker had his crew cut again this road eight miles through the forest to get to that pier. All they did was move product. Because Casco had multiple mills. It had a furniture factory, a woodenware factory, other industries. And they all needed to ship south. Because Chicago at that point, Chicago burned too. Most people don't know that. But Chicago <laughs> burned too. Okay. They needed wood very, very badly at that point. And Decker was more than willing to supply them. So he was desperate to get a pier in and get their, their goods out to market. After the boom was over and Chicago was rebuilt, Langworthy was basically discarded. So away it went. Sandy Bay, further south near that nuclear power plant I was talking about, okay, slightly different. They were one of the first piers built, the second actually in Kiwani County, uh, just by an, a whale, a whaler of all things, who sailed the Great Lakes and then came here, a little lost, no whales, decided he'd, he'd go into lumbering. He and his father-in-law built a mill at the mouth of Fish Creek there and started things. And I think they, they quickly realized this is going to be a, a bit more expensive and difficult than they thought because they were approached pretty quickly by the Feaster and Vogel Leather Company who planned to open a tannery, a branch tannery in Two Creeks and they said, we would like to buy your property and expand your pier. And Mr. McNally and his wife said, yes, <laughs> and sold them half the property with the deal that they got to use that lovely brand new pier. So they got the expense taken off their books and they just sat back and sold lumber. So good for them. And then when they got too old to do it anymore, they closed their mill down and built a hotel. And the, the Lakeside House apparently did very good. Mrs. McNally was apparently a great cook. She has a recipe for pound cake that I think would probably punch a hole in a table if you set it down. She said it kept very well. I'm going to try it when the study is done. <laughs> they shipped out a ton of hemlock bark, of course, to Milwaukee to supply the Feaster and Vogel Leather Company. Also known is the location of the wreck of the Thomas Spear. So this is the only shipwreck associated within these communities we're able to actually confirm and, and find on site. The Thomas Spear was a tug that went down just as this community was actually shutting down. So we've got a little map there. You see McNally's Hotel, uh, the mill where we think it was located, uh, the McNally House, the pier extending out in the lake. The north side of the ravine is the Feaster and Vogel property with their store. Okay. 
And just as everything is sort of winding down there, Feaster and Vogel sell out to their foreman, a guy named John Wigley, who's the carpenter and probably responsible for building and maintaining the pier as well. He bought too late. The lumber boom is over. He's not making much money, so he starts tearing down buildings. And it's at that point that the Thomas Spear comes by and then catches on fire. And they know the pier's there, so they start making for shore just as fast as they can. The captain has just decided to change clothes. He took his wallet out of his pocket. Isn't this how it always happens? He took his wallet out of his pocket, put it on his bed just as the fire alarm went off. Okay. So he ran to go deal with that and left his ID, money, everything, credit cards. You know, that's 1881. <laughs> but yeah, but they're on the bed. The pump they needed to put the fire out was in the room that was on fire. So they said one of the firemen tried, and his whiskers started to singe and smoke, and his hair started to curl, so they decided maybe not. So they ordered abandoned ship right almost before they got to shore. They were just a little ways out, so everyone off the side into the ship's boat and started pulling for the pier. In the meantime, the Thomas Spear is sort of drifting around on fire. A schooner comes by. It's getting foggy. They see the glow and go over to see what's happening, circle it for a while to make sure nobody's in the water and realize nobody is, so they take off. In the meantime, the crew has marched up the pier road to the store, and there was at least a telegraph office there. So they radio for help. Ship on fire. We had to cut our, the, the barges we were towing loose, come help. They came, found it too late. The, the thing had burned to the water line and, and sunk there on the shore. You can see it on Google Earth if you know where you're looking. So zoom right in just off a of, a little northeast of the, that nuclear power plant, and you'll see it sitting in water, so the side of it there can just kind of help you. Okay. This is what it looked like. This is not the Thomas Spear. This is the Thomas Spear. So they replaced it with an absolutely identical ship and named it the same thing. <laughs> so what a look just like this and what it looks like today. So one of our, our lovely maps that our, our divers make here. They tried to get the engine and boiler out of this. The, the rights to salvage sold through about 10 different hands over the next five or six years. It took forever. They were using stump pullers, even, to try and pull the equipment out. It took forever. They finally did it, get it out. So the machinery is gone, but the, the hull of the ship is still there. Okay. Dean's Pier, our next one, Carlton. This is the one that really got me interested in ghost port. Okay. In part because of a neighbor named John Whitaker. He lived within a mile of the pier and he wrote and he wrote and he wrote. He was a local correspondent to the newspaper. The guy could have given Mark Twain a run for his money. His stuff is hysterical. He poked fun at every single person in that town at least once. So it, it, I felt like I knew all these folks, all their little quirks and habits and, you know, and how they felt about things. And, and Dean Spear has a heck of a history, too. It was the most successful of all of these ghost ports. It lasted quite a long time and made a fair amount of money for the owners, which the others sometimes did, sometimes didn't. Started out founded by Elisha Dean and his cousin John Borland. Did the usual business. They had a mill. They had a grist mill. They had the store. They cut the usual timber products and shipped them out. When the Civil War erupted, John Borland felt like he had something to offer, and he joined the Kiwani Guards. Now, the Kiwani Guards, for the most part, guarded. They did see some action, mustered in at Camp Siegel in Milwaukee, and they were almost immediately called back to Kiwani because of a draft riot. A bunch of Belgian immigrants had just gotten their draft notices, were not happy about it. <laughs> Okay. decided to riot by storming into Kiwani and storming the draft office. The draft officer heard them coming down the street and ran for it, ran down that pier, jumped onto one of the steamships and headed for Milwaukee, left his wife standing there. Okay. So in come the rioters. They only speak French. She doesn't speak French. They had to smooth things out of her, a little meal of cheese and crackers. So he got to come back, then mustered, shipped out, was wounded severely in the Battle of Jenkins Ferry in 1864 and had to be mustered out again. When he arrives back north, he's greeted with the news that a wildfire has swept in and burned the entire community to the ground. He lost, I, I checked, you know, did a little math, the inflation, he lost a million dollars. So, you know, Welcome back, you're in horrible pain, you got wounded in Arkansas, you're broke. <laughs> 
Fortunately, he had already made some contacts in Chicago, formed another company with a, a dealer there, and by the time he passes away a couple decades later, he's a millionaire again. So he gets at least a happy story. Dean, in the meantime, needs a new partner, brings in a former acquaintance and accomplice of his uh, named Joel Vesivius Taylor. Then Dean gets tired of everything. Taylor now needs a new partner, and he picks their clerk, Edward Buck, who had also served in the, the Kiwani Guards with Borland. Okay. Ed brings in his brother, Frederick. Okay. Their sister marries a blacksmith named John Dishmaker Sr. They have a couple of kids. Okay. Fred marries Imogene St. Peter, daughter of one of the first settlers. Uh, after he passes, she marries Wenzel Keywig, who is also working at the community. Wenzel's daughter marries Alfred Arpin, a cheesemaker. All these people are related to each other. Near the end, Carlton is basically these families. And Carlton's amazing, because they had a few things that the other communities didn't. For one, a fantastic pier. It's the most intact of all of them. It survived the, the, the best. This is the one where you can see the pilings up above water if, if the water's low enough. In absolutely great condition there. Oh. Beautiful stuff. Parts of the pier have fallen. You can see kind of what looks like a ladder. This is just part of, of the support structure that's fallen next to this one. Okay. Highlighted there. Okay. Joe Vesivius Taylor owned a fleet of ships. So he was able to keep their costs down by basically they had their own transportation. The schooner driver was the most frequent visitor to the pier. Also, the Goodrich propeller to pair. So the Goodrich line took care of most of the passenger and packet trade along the lake. The folks at Carlton had an absolute great gimmick for this. The Goodrich line was supposed to stop at Carlton, but it didn't always. Sometimes on the way back from Sturgeon Bay, if they'd already picked up enough goods, they would telegraph ahead and say, we're not going to stop at Carleton. We don't have the room. Okay. Ed Bach and his brother and Winslow Keywig all learned how to use the telegraph. They put a telegraph office in the pier store and learned how to use it so they could eavesdrop. When they would hear these messages come through, Winslow Keywig would grab his two young sons, race up to Kiwanee to the Goodrich office, have them buy tickets to Carleton. The ship would then be forced to stop, and Wenzel would walk out, and he was known as the guy who could talk anybody to anything, and he'd walk out there, and he'd talk their cargo on board, and off it would go to Chicago. And he's one of the reasons this, this peer community did so well. And this is another. Ed Bach loved agriculture. He was an acolyte of Horde, the guy who got Wisconsin's dairy industry. He was reading all the scientific literature coming at UW-Madison. He bought tons of land for farming, and he put in a show farm, an absolute model farm. Everything was mechanized. Everything was modern. He grew the best crops and then sold that seed, of course, right back through the Pierce store. And he saw the end of the lumber boom coming well in advance, even wrote an editorial in the paper, felt words of truth and soberman, uh, so soberness to the gentlemen of Kiwani County. It basically what it said is, we're about to run out of trees, folks. And when that happens, if we want to keep making money, we'd better find something else to do. Shortly after writing that editorial, he packed the sawmill up, put it on wagons, took it to Green Bay, and shipped it off to Michigan, sold it, the whole mill. He was basically saying, we are out of the lumber business. They weren't actually, but they were out of the milling business. And then he started focusing on agriculture. And he had this wild, wild idea that maybe, just maybe, just maybe, Wisconsin's future might lie in cheese. He built a cheese factory, an absolute scientific, top-of-the-line cheese factory, and started producing, by what all accounts were, fantastic cheddar and American brick cheese. Sold at very high prices in Chicago. So instead of shipping out lumber near the end of the year, they're shipping out boxes of cheese and grain and butter and all kinds of agricultural products. And that buoyed them up as the other peer communities were failing. They started devoting a lot of attention to that peer store, lots of ads, good prices, general goods. They opened a branch store in Norman, Wisconsin for just a little bit, made some money off of that, and then they pooled all of their resources 
and bought a giant lot in Kiwani itself and put up a multi-story brick department store and sold Carlton. And that was the end of Carlton because they were pretty much the only residents by this point. So Carlton is the community that succeeded itself to death. And this was a multi-generational business. Uh, so the kids took over, the grandkids took over. So this, this was a fixture in Kiwani for, for many, many years. The last beer community I kind of like to refer to as Carlton's evil twin, Foscaro. <laughs> Run for the most part by this gentleman, Captain Fellows, and his sons. His sons didn't want to. They left one after the other. Foscaro was more or less cursed. Captain Fellows did not make good decisions and had the awfulest run of bad luck that you can imagine. It got to the point where I didn't even want to track down the employees anymore because invariably something awful happened to them. <laughs> okay. The last guy, I'm like, I, I can't, I can't, I don't want to know what happened to this, to this blacksmith. I just don't. Okay, all right. He lived a long time. Surely he's fine. He's one of the last few people to live in Foscaro. He'll be fine. No, no, struck by a stray bullet <laughs> that bounced off a tree. And yeah, you know, like, okay, yeah. Everything that could go wrong with this community went wrong. They hung on, regardless. They put in a water mill, water instead of steam power for the mill. Because of the fire, the deforestation, the water table dropped. Most of the water mills in Kiwani County became useless very quickly. So they were only able to run the mill a little in the spring each year, and it was never enough really to keep the ship that he bought occupied. The ship sank multiple times, had been hit by lightning a couple of times before he even bought it. It finally got caught in a storm loading at one of the piers. He was actually on board. The ship actually got picked up and impaled on that pier itself. And he was one of the last people, he was the last person off. Lost a ton of money on that ship. Thought, okay, I'll buy another one. Buys a sunken tug. The, the, the tug was underwater when he bought it. Okay. Raises it, spends a ton of money refitting it. Launches it, it sinks the next day. <laughs> Torn to shreds. He lost one of his sons in a freak hay wagon accident. Uh, horrible lingering death, unfortunately. Okay. The rest were at least injured at least once. He was injured a couple of times. I, and that pier got destroyed by ice over and over and over and over again to the point, at one point, half the piers ripped away and they said, well, you're going to rebuild. And he's like, eh, <laughs> it's good enough. <laughs> at another point, they're like, hey, you know, it makes the papers. The Fellows Clan has come up with a cost-effective way to build piers. You just put the pilings in and let gravity pull them down. Okay. A few months later, part of their pier fell over. <laughs> Just spontaneous. We don't know why. <laughs> Bad decisions. Okay. So Foscaro just lingers. It died a slow, slow, lingering death. And eventually, the buildings just burn one by one. Just, just Foscaro ends. So how do these communities function? Well, the pier and the store, they, they, they work in harmony. Hopefully, money's being made going out. Money's being made as goods come in. 1860s, they're founded in what's a forested environment. People settle at the mouths of the river. They settle at the mouths of the small streams that they can dam up. And there's not much difference between what would become the harbor towns, the surviving towns, and the ghost towns at this point, apart from the river. But those rivers attract attention. They attract federal money and state money and community money because people want to improve the harbors. And once the harbors are put into place, ships want to go there. Businesses want to locate there because they're safer. The more commerce that relocates to a community, the more commerce wants to relocate to that community. The more settlers want to stay at the community. So the harbor towns begin to grow just a little bit faster and outcompete just a little bit quicker than the little rural ports do. After a while, the timber within reach of all the communities is cut away. The mills in both locations start to shut down and are reestablished further inland at fords and in streams and crossroads. 
those places then become little competitors with our peer communities. The peer communities, meanwhile, if they're smart, and they don't have a harbor to fall back on, like Carlton, are thinking about what else they can do. In Carlton's case, it's cheese, so let's, let's do dairy. They then say, we're going to buy milk. The farmers around go, okay, well, we can't sell the timber off our land anymore because it's gone, but we can buy cows. We can sell you milk. So now everyone decides to do dairy. Kiwani County becomes a dairy producing area in part because of Carlton. They show that it can be done and you can make a fair amount of money off of it. That then sparks competitors. People start opening cheese shops of their own, which affects the market again. And then when the railroad comes in, it bypasses the little rural peers. They can't compete at all. So inland communities where the road's going, they can. They've, they've got their cheese factories. Now they've got a railroad stop. They still have their stores. You don't need a pier anymore. And the piers fade away. So our next steps are to head up to Door County. We, we did some field work up there. I'm happy to say that we relocated seven piers, visited three more, uh, what was it, Tammy, four shipwrecks. Yeah, beautiful countryside, best workcation I've ever had. Completely different landscape, however, lots uh, more cribbing. And these communities are hanging on just a little bit longer because the logging boom is moving north, which means that we have more photographs of these locations. We have more firsthand knowledge of these locations. So I'm very, very excited to see what the, the research is going to bring us. Because these communities have brought us so many stories like Foscaro and Carlton and Cheese already. Let's see what Door County can give us. So I do need to thank a few people. Most importantly, Wisconsin Coastal Management Program and NOAA for, for giving us that lovely, lovely funding. The volunteers who helped us, Bob Jake, Bob Violet, Russell Leitz, uh, Michelle Hagerman, and others, Winter, Wisconsin Underwater Archaeology Association for giving us some research on ghost ports of Clay Banks Township in Door County. Uh, the Ronk family for getting this started, Dan Joyce Crossman Consulting for helping us out with Ronk's Pier, and uh, Dan Joyce, I'm sorry, the, the hardest GPR he, he ever did up in Kiwani County. Uh, the owners of these locations, of course, Tammy and the staff at the SHPO. And again, thank you to Coastal Management. And one last thank you to Jim, okay, who will be very missed. Okay. So thank you all. <laughs> Hope you have a good night. All right. Questions? Tom's running Mike. Forward. Yeah, I was interested uh, particularly in the start of your presentation. Uh, I grew up uh, many moons ago on the north shore of Milwaukee, and I'm familiar with some of those areas like Ulao and Lake Church, even though the piers or the supporting villages aren't there anymore, but there's still roads named after mm -hmm. both of those places, and I often wondered what the... Uh, origin of them was, so I found that part interesting. Also, you mentioned lime kilns. Um, there's a, a relatively new state park, Harrington Beach, I think it is, which includes an old lime kiln, so I'm wondering if probably that was one of those that uh, was a source for some of the products that you uh, discussed. Thanks. Sure, probably using the wood, and, and we'll check the location because uh, we're, we're still a little light on the piers around Milwaukee because some of them came and went so early that the newspaper accounts aren't picking them up. Uh, we do know of one of our Door County communities at Toft Point. If you've, if you've never been to Toft Point State Natural Area, uh, north, just a little northeast of Bailey's Harbor, oh, go, it is beautiful. That was a stone quarry instead of a lumbering pier. And they have a fantastic, if you've seen this year's Wisconsin Archaeology Month poster, the lime kiln is prominently featured on that. It is absolutely gorgeous. So it's entirely possible that some of these kilns were feeding their, their product out to the piers and around. Yeah, Newark County is yeah. extensive. Oh, yeah. Limestone. So um, you talked a lot about this with the commerce and the, you know, the landowners. Were, did these communities have local governments as well? Nope. <laughs> yeah, the, many of the, the owners and managers were involved in politics, but they weren't 
towns like we would think of towns. This is what's so interesting, Ronksville, so you think of a town. It's more of an industrial complex. Yeah. The communities, the town is the town of, town of Carlton, town of Clay Banks. It's the rural community that they're really tying into. As there's a, usually a school nearby, there's a cemetery nearby. The town hall may or may not be in the vicinity. Okay. But then the owners go in because they're usually pretty wealthy. They want, it, they want power. So Edward Decker, for example, was a state senator, uh, was county clerk for many, many years and held tight to the, the reins of power in Kewanee County. Uh, John McNally, founder of Sandy Bay, was uh, on the local school board, helped organize the township itself. You told the story of uh, the ship that burned, burned down to the waterline, and they made another one just like it. Mm -hmm. And behind the ship, there was like two lines, like some dragging behind this ship. Yeah. What was that? Okay, now I'm going to def defer to Tammy here. I believe that's uh, booming, so they are actually dragging log rafts behind, which was something that they, they did a little bit later. Okay, when they, the lumber scooter has started to kind of age out. So they grab these great big rafts of logs and kind of circle them with stuff and then kind of drag them along. Okay. Tammy's nodding, so that's okay, yes, good. <laughs> Not a question, but a comment. But it was a really fun presentation and all. But uh, having grown up with Shetland ponies and horses, it was really hard for me to hear you call them vicious. <laughs> But in this, I, this I, county, they were. I guess so if they are moving arms and all. But um, it, was, it was a great presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much. And, and I will say that doing all this research, especially the John Whitaker's writings, I was having so much fun reading his stuff, I thought other people should know this too. So the eventual end goal of this, uh, the Door County as well, is we're hoping to publish a book uh, called Bridging Worlds. So we'll get some of that fun stuff I wasn't able to get to in there. Other questions? Thanks. Yeah, I was wondering, was the origin of the name of Alaska, was that due to the presence of this Russian nobleman? Uh, no. <laughs> there, there, there are two stories about how Alaska gets its name. Uh, the fake one is that it was as cold as Alaska, which I think there, there is a little community of Alaska today. That, that is not, however, Alaska Pier. So there are t t tale of two Alaska. So Alaska today is a little inland from Alaska Pier. When Alaska Pier went down, everyone moved to where the saloon was. <laughs> That's how Alaska, modern Alaska gets its start. Uh, the, the actual story is it was founded right around the time that we bought Alaska. So. I actually have a, an ancestor named Alaska Abigail. She was born around that time, too. Everything was Alaska for a while. How, if at all, will these communities fit in with the new national maritime um, Park or lake shore. The sanctuary, yeah. Sanctuary. Uh, you notice we skipped over that central area. <laughs> That's NOAA territory right now. Uh, it's, it's, it's our territory, but we're going to let NOAA, since they've got all the money and all the, the really fancy toys, we're going to let them handle that one and we'll kind of, we'll take care of the spots outside the sanctuary and then hopefully we can kind of compare notes in the future. The um, <coughs> signs that you mentioned at, I think it's Newport Beach? Oh, Newport, yes, yes, it's fantastic. Yeah, maritime trails markers are there. Yeah. There's a lovely kiosk with all these historic images. Please. Very helpful, just there last year. Is there money and oomph to put signs up at all these other places? Why you should mention that. So we, we are working on a sign right now for Ronksville. And uh, I, I hope to have some of these signed. Uh, the, the ones in Door County that we're working at now, a uh, fair number of them are actually at uh, places where roads end and uh, where there are little boat ramps today. And I think it would be absolutely awesome to get signs up at more of these locations. Uh, I have a question, but um, I really couldn't resist. Is there going to be a horror movie made of these vicious horses? <laughs> <laughs> I could so see that. <laughs> so, okay. How many, people, no. <laughs> yeah. how, many, how many people here 
ever seen Seth MacFarlane's A Million Ways to Die in the West? Oh, that's a great movie. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to get word. I've got a friend who has some Hollywood contacts. I'm like, can you please get word to Seth MacFarlane? Because I want a TV show called A Million Ways to Die in Kiwanee County. <laughs> <laughs> it, perfect. Yeah. I'd watch it. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, okay. So the history of that period, like 1850, or probably earlier a little bit, and uh, through, I guess, the later half of the you know, 1800s. But is that unique to, um, you know, the east coast of Wisconsin and the Great Lakes, or could that similar kind of story be told on other shorelines of all the Great Lakes? I, I suspect on the other shorelines as well. Uh, Michigan, definitely. Uh, so when Elisha Dean leaves Dean's Pier, he moves to what's, uh, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Manistique, Manistique Michigan, uh, which was a community. It was a similar community over on the Michigan side. Okay. And there are peers, again, I think absolutely fringing all of Lake Michigan if we could do that. We know of some not community communities, but definitely peers up in the Apostle Islands where they're quarrying the stones. So, so there's some stuff on Lake Superior as well. What I've wondered is uh, after Dean gets tired of Michigan, he went into the lumber business out on the West Coast. So I got to wonder with all the logging industry there, are there ocean born ghost ports out there that are following the Great Lakes model, you know, based on his experience and others. So something to pick up maybe way down the line. Yeah. It's amazing to me that the logs are still there. Do you know what kind of uh, trees primarily they were made out of? We do not. And I was thinking about that after our Door County visit. I think the next time we go out, we're going to take a couple of samples and bring them back to Forest Products Lab. We know from accounts of the construction of Kiwani Harbor that the feds were saying you will need oak and you will need cedar and you will need, you know, they named a couple of species. I have a feeling that they're using what's around, so pine and cedar would be my guess. But well, we'll see. Okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you so much.